Hi there and welcome to this Explaining History video cast and the thing that we're going to be looking at in this video is the uh, WJEC's uh, HY2 uh, Nazi Germany uh, paper 1933 to 45. Um, we're going to be looking at how to go about answering the questions and how that relates to the Marx scheme um, which is the most important document that probably um, a lot of students never get to see. Now, my disclaimer before I go any further is that um, I'm not from the WJEC. This is not accredited by the WJEC, um, and the uh, the WJEC and I have no kind of uh, no kind of relationship at all. Um, so I'm not making out anything that really I I can't claim. Um, However, um, the knowledge that I'm going to give you is based on many, many years of attending uh, the WJEC's inset days and marking exams and uh, generally uh, teaching history in Wales for a good long time. So let's, let's make a start. OK, so let's look at the past paper first. So this is the 2014 paper. Um, and we're going to look at the um, the first question. Remember, you're going to be uh, asked to do either question one or question two. Don't be the two to three percent of candidates that try to do both. Um, people do do that. Um, okay. So let's scroll down and look at the uh, the first question. So. Overall tonight, I'm going to be talking more about structure than actually um, getting trying to teach you content. Okay. What does the, so the author of Source E mean by the phrase, I have brought about change in Russia gradually? Okay, so the obvious thing to do is look at the bit in italics. The examiner specifically put this here so that you are um, given a, a, an extra chance. The number of people that disregard this every year is quite high. So in your answer, you're advised to discuss both the content and authorship of the source and use your knowledge. So content and authorship, for you get approximately about five out of the eight marks for that, and about three for um, your own knowledge. Um, this is a question that will require some degree of knowledge. So let's look at Saucy, what it's actually saying. Okay. Now... Our enemies are little worms. I came to know them at Munich. I have brought about change towards Russia gradually. The day after tomorrow, von Ribbentrop will conclude the non-aggression pact. Now Poland is in the position which I wanted her. So firstly, let's look at the attribution of the source. Now the first mistake that people are going to make, they will see these words, Adolf Hitler, and assume this is a source from Adolf Hitler. Well, Adolf Hitler is being quoted in the source, but it's not him that has written it. Okay, the Adolf Hitler, the leader of Germany, in a speech to his commanders on the August the twenty second, nineteen thirty nine. His speech is based on unofficial notes by taken by um, Admiral Canaris. Now there is your first clue. That piece of information has been put there for a reason. Um, the first thing that you can say about this source is that um, it, there are issues with it. Firstly, it's based on unofficial notes taken by a canaris, so it's not an official record of the meeting. Um, it's possible, and don't, you don't need to actually say that this, that, this, that this for certainty, but you say there is the possibility that canaris uh, may have made these notes um, away from the meeting. So they might not be what we would call a verbatim account of what Hitler was saying. Instead, they might be um, a... Uh, a second, a second-hand account from Canaris writing from memory. So Hitler may not possibly have said these things in the way that he'd said them. Also, if you are to look up Admiral Canaris, you'll know that he's chiefly involved in the bomb plot against Hitler later on um, in 1944. Um, so they, there are again issues here with um, you know. Uh, the source there are is this possible this is an opponent of Hitler's somebody who was looking to to undermine him or present paint him in a particular light and so we just need to be kind of um, aware of that what I think is worth avoiding is this idea that if you do know that Canaris wasn't fond of Hitler is using uh, is saying ah oh, well he's biased this is biased this is a biased source and we, we can't rely on it well all sources are biased every single one of them Anything that's ever been written by a human being has biases in it. 
Therefore, we have to go. Uh, we have to work on the assumption that even though it is biased, even though the, even though Canaris uh, evidently has biases, he will still give us something that we can that could be useful to a historian. Um, and we don't want to go down too far down that line anyway, because um, we're looking for the question again. A challenge is to um, question what the meaning of the phrase is. Okay, so. The, the meaning of the phrase really is he's referring to the uh, molotov ribbentrop Pact of uh, August 1939. Um, the um, idea that he'd brought about the gradual, he, he brought about the, the change towards Russia gradually. Well, uh, from 1933 onwards, Hitler is, uh, Hitler's foreign policy towards Russia is stridently anti-communist, um, very aggressive policy towards Russia. Um, and the, the height of which really is in 1936 when the, both sides are supporting different factions in the Spanish Civil War. Um, the, uh, there is in, in August 1939, on the eve of the Second World War, um, a, a kind of a revolution really in Nazi foreign policy whereby the Nazis are, uh, well, Hitler um, pursues the Nazi Soviet Pact uh, with Stalin. So um, the, the, this change has happened in Hitler's eyes gradually. In the eyes of the rest of the world, it's a kind of a, quite a radical turnaround of events. Um, you might possibly want to mention that when he's referring to Munich, he's talking about, obviously, the, the Munich um, Agreement of 1938 and um, his opinions, the, the enemies in question, revenue people like Neville Chamberlain. Um, so for the, for this question, you do need a fair amount of contextualising knowledge. Um, the um, um, the actual source comes from from Canaris, and you and so you you can um, comment on the source and suggest that perhaps the source um, has some issues with it. Steer away from bias. It is it drives the WJC examiners crazy. Um, and it's a way of, of really inaccurately just dismissing um, a valuable piece of historical evidence. And of course, all sources are biased. OK, so next one. How important was terror in controlling opposition in the Third Reich? Explain your answer, uh, analysing and evaluating the content and authorship of sources A and B and using your own knowledge. OK. So what have we got? Source A. We have um, a painter who's been painting uh, pictures of, who is painting pictures of Hitler under um, sufferance and the coercion from a, um, an, an SS uh, officer threatening him with a, a truncheon. So it strongly implies that, the, that, that uh, artists and creative people in Germany are uh, under threat of violence. However, it, we know it's it's a satirical, satirical cartoon, so it's you know taken with a pinch of salt. Um, there is a kind of an element of kind of satirical license here, but interestingly, it's the interesting bit. It comes from a Czechoslovakian magazine, so one can safely assume that it's being published in Czechoslovakia for Czech speakers. The cartoonist, whilst he is creating an image of Nazi Germany that appears to be largely accurate, it appears to chime with everything else we know, still is um, a, a, an external uh, observer looking inwards. Where he's what he's basing his views on um, might be purely anecdotal. We're not sure. Also, um, it, this does this reflect the views of German people in Germany? Not so much. It actually reflects the views of Czech people who are observing Germany. And 1938 is obviously a very interesting year for that kind of thing. Um, it is the year of the annexation of the Sudetenland. Um, it would be interesting to put in your answer, perhaps with the date. Uh, the date's been put in there for a clear reason. Um, whether or not this is written before or after the, uh, the annexation, uh, of the Sudetenland, because obviously that has a um, a, a clear uh, will have a clear effect on how people in uh, Czechoslovakia were looking at uh, their German neighbours. It's those kinds of observations. It's those kinds of um, um, those that kind of detail that when you uh, hit upon it and 
pose that question, you don't even have to have an answer because recognising that sources are incomplete is an essential part of this process. That's the kind of thing that will get you marks, and that's the kind of thing that will uh, st um, stand you uh, out from the rest of the you know, middle grade students who are perhaps not going to go about this in as a thorough way as hopefully you guys will. Um, and it's the kind of thing that will give you the opportunity to discuss and to explore, and therein are your marks. Next source. I became Commissioner of the Interior um, in the state of Prussia, at the same time um, Minister of the, of the German Reich. I gave strict orders and demanded that the police should devote all their energies to the ruthless extermination of subversive elements. Finally, I alone created on my own the state secret police department. This is the instrument which is so feared by the enemies of the state, and which is chiefly responsible for the fact that in Germany today there is no question of Marxist or communist danger. This is Hermann Goering, a leading Nazi, writing about the setting up of the Gestapo in his book Germany Reborn. Yes, these things did happen. However, um, can we rely on this entirely? Is this a kind of a, uh, a clear picture of the, the operation of, uh, of Nazi terror? Let's just quickly go back to the question and read again what it's asking us. How important was terror in controlling opposition to the Third Reich? Well, uh, at first glance, we'd have to conclude from this source here that um, terror is extremely important. But, firstly... The impression that um, Goering gives is that he is solely responsible, really, for the establishment of the terror state in Germany, which is really not the case. Um, and secondly, the, he, what isn't addressed in this source is the idea that there was widespread consent um, in 1933 to 34. The idea that um, terror is fairly, fairly um, targeted um, against enemies of the regime. It's not the kind of indiscriminate terror that exists in Soviet Russia during the purges, for example. It's a, a more um, focused um, terror, and that means that the majority of Germans adopt a, a principle of, well, if you haven't really done anything wrong, there's not much to worry about, and um, it's best simply to kind of mind one's own business. And they these are the majority of, of Germans in 1933 to 34 before really kind of the um, appeal of the regime starts to wane around 1935. The the majority of Germans um, were looking to the regime to solve it, solve the problems of the economy to create new institutions, new national institutions such as the KDF and the other kind of institutions of Volksgemeinschaft. And they were actually enjoying, perhaps enjoying is maybe too strong a word, but participating in the the activities of the regime uh, in um, on a widespread scale. One only needs to look at the uh, large numbers of people attending the Nuremberg rallies. And these are people that are not being terrorised. These are people that do, do not feel terrorised. The If you look at the exact numbers of the exact ratio of Gestapo men to the general population. Um, uh, Roger Morehouse's Berlin at War is, has a chapter which features this, and it's a, it's a really, really useful book. It would give you the impression, really, that the majority of Germans probably didn't really come across the Gestapo. Um, the majority of Germans uh, were um, probably not arrested or interrogated or interviewed or even questioned by the Gestapo. There is a fear of denunciation, certainly, and then there is a, a general fear, a feeling that it is wise to watch what one says. The extent to which you can call that terror is is a different a, a different matter. So, the using your own knowledge, uh, well, our own knowledge tells us that you know to some extent, to a, to to a certain degree, um, there is a uh, that terrorism um, is um, reasonably important. But for a lot of the time, uh, particularly from 1933 30, um, uh, to 39, consent is a much, much uh, more important factor. Another thing that you can bring to this question is, question is is saying essentially, well, it depends when you ask. If we're looking at terror, then we'd have to say that 
the conditions that exist in 1933 are certainly very different to the ones that exist in 1944, and following the, the bomb plot. In the last year of the, uh, the regime, uh, there is a widespread terror. Um, there is a, um, a, a violence by the regime against the citizenry um, to keep them fighting, to prevent any uh, surrender or defeatism, uh, and to um, keep uh, the entire nation uh, ready to resist the Red Army as it, as it marches forwards. So, um, there is, if you introduce the idea of there being change over time, that when depending on when you're asking, you get a different picture, again, that will get you more marks than simply saying, yes, there was lots of terror. No, there wasn't much terror. Um, obviously, these things are conditional on, on periods of time. So, how important was terror in controlling opposition um, to the Third Reich? For, you know, explain your answer. Um, analyzing, evaluating the contents and authorships of the sources. So, again, that that is um, uh, looking at uh, what the sources are saying, the, ex the extent to which we can rely on them, um, and the extent to which um, uh, the, the that um, really is supported by your own knowledge. Let's look at the the next one. Do you agree with the interpretation that Christian churches in Germany supported the Nazi regime? Okay, so you're being drawn into a trap here. And this is the trap. Christian churches. Well, there are two distinct kinds of Christian church in Germany, Protestant and Catholic. And of the Protestant, the Protestant uh, churches tend to divide into the Reich and the Confessing churches. Um, so you, the interpretation um, that uh, the um, Christian churches supported the Nazi regime already there, you could start to build an introduction saying this interpretation is too simplistic. Now you might, uh, when you get a um, a paper in uh, in May, it will have a similar kind of question. Look for the simplicities. Look for the do you agree with the interpretation that all Germans were terrified of Hitler all the time? Do you agree with the interpretation that Hitler's econ economic policy was an outstanding success? Well, obviously, in the real world, you don't get these kinds of scenarios. You don't get the, 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 the scenario that things are I, massively successful all the time or complete failures all the time. There are, we are looking at the kind of the confusing shades of grey. Can't believe I uh, I said that. Um, okay, so let's look at sources C and D. It's difficult to account for the meagre resistance of most clergy, although their distrust of left-wing thinking, their own conservatism, and their tradition of loyalty to the state all played in their part. Whatever the reason, the church's overall response to Nazism was timid and half-hearted, and helped erode their influence in German life. So this is A. Wilt, an academic historian, writing a specialist book on Nazi Germany called Nazi Germany 1994. So he has all the credentials. Um, there are, there are, you know, he's an academic historian. This implies he's a man who's done research. Um, he implies he's a, a specialist in his field, so he knows of what he speaks. Um, the point is that what he's talking about here is that the, the churches are half-hearted in their resistance. That is a world away from saying that they support it. The two are not the same. Support is a, an overt act of commitment and loyalty. Um, it's not, you, you can't uh, call um, a, a, a fear of um, doing something to oppose actual support in itself. It's, it's a totally different animal. Let's look at D. Positive work on behalf of the National Socialist State and Party has recently become uh, completely impossible in this village. This is because Chaplain Fath, the hostile local priest, he agitates in secret against the youth organisations. This is provided by the fact that the number of girls in the Hitler Youth is 17, while the number of um, this is proved, I beg your pardon, by the fact that the number of girls in the Hitler Youth is 17, while the number in Congregation of Mary is almost 200. So in a way, this is inconclusive, but in the other direction. So this is an extract from a report by the local branch of the Gestapo from a Nazi school teacher in the village of, of uh, Liedersbach, uh, 
the report denounced Cap Chaplin Fath, the local priest. So here, our question again is, do you agree with the interpretation that Nazi in church uh, in uh, that Christian churches in Germany supported the Nazi regime? Well, ostensibly, we'd have to agree here um, at face value that Chaplin Fath, at least, um, didn't support the Nazi regime. So we'd have to say that while well, source D is inconclusive in suggesting uh, support, this one, yeah, sure, this this surely indicates that there was uh, there were opponents to the regime, or does it? Um, I would say that it's it's a weak source. Firstly, it's a report to the Gestapo from a Nazi school teacher who denounces Chaplin Fath. We don't know who the school teacher is. We don't know what relation he had to Fath, what the rival was, why they had this, um, you know, uh, animosity towards him, what have you. It could be that this thing was completely fabricated. Also, the evidence that the report suggests is just is flimsy. Um, this, this, this is proved by the fact that the number of girls in the Hit Youth is, Hit Youth is 17, while the number in the Congregation of Mary is almost 200. That proves nothing. And it is okay for you, it's okay for you as a student to critically engage with the source and to, uh, to disagree with it, and to disagree with what it purports to be proving. And again, those are the kinds of skills, if you present them that are going to get you better marks um, because it shows you're critically engaging with the source and arguing. It might be that there were all sorts of reasons for the um, Hitler Youth to be unpopular and the Congregation of Mary uh, to be much more popular. Um, there are so many reasons that you know um, one would have to conduct some intense research of uh, leaders back in order to, to make any sense of it, to find that out. Um, we don't know anything about Chaplin Fath either. I mean, we don't know, there's no other evidence to suggest he's hostile. We don't know what other things he's been doing. Um, and we don't know what, what other kind of um, evidence the Gestapo might have collected. If the Gestapo are just working on denunciations, they're probably, you know, perhaps, I say probably perhaps, they're not looking to create a wider picture. Uh, maybe they'll just go and arrest him, um, and they're not thinking of creating a, a, a wider and more valid picture for historians to use. So again, this 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 is inconclusive. So the first source um, suggests uh, all this suggests is that the um, as it says, whatever the reason, the church's overall response to Nazism was timid and half-hearted and helped erode their influence in German life. That does not suggest support. That suggests a fear of opposition. This is um, unreliable and inconclusive, and, 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 but as a result doesn't really give us a clear picture that there was, um, from Chaplin Fath's point of view, um, opposition. So putting the two together, um, what we can say is that, that instead of having this um, statement um, that the Christian Church has supported the Nazi regime, what we've got is a very ambiguous picture that is, in one case, presents a, um, a view of the Nazi regime that uh, the churches um, were, were simply um, ineffectual in, in, in opposition, um, uh, which doesn't sort of imply support uh, at all. Um, and then we have this, the, um, the claim that, the, uh, that Chaplin Fath was an ardent uh, opponent of the regime is, is, is largely unsubstantiated and, and, and vague and, and unreliable. Um, so, no, basically, the interpretation that the Christian Church has supported the Nazi regime is, is not made there, really. How useful are sources A, E and F in understanding Nazi Germany 33 to 39? So, it all depends what you mean by useful. Um, usefulness, really, to me, is um, kind of reliability plus content. So, it, we could have... Um, we could have a you know the Hitler's third book turn up and be full of um, you know fascinating revelations about what Hitler thought, uh, and yet it be completely useless because we just can't verify it. 
or we could have Hitler's third book turn up and it be signed by Adolf Hitler and dated, here is the book that I wrote in 1937 or what have you, and it being, you know, a, a totally verified source, but full of the most inconsequential, boring stuff imaginable. So what we have to have is a, uh, we, 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 what we have to have is reliable evidence that we can point to and say, yes, this, this is um, verifiably, um, you know, um, written uh, by, well, by people we know who, who wrote it and written at the time and, um, and all the rest. The, the um, attribution has to be good. But it also has to have something interesting in it worth saying. Second point about this is that um, how useful are sources A, E, and F in understanding Nazi Germany, 1933 to 39? The trick here that you're going to, um, it's going to hoover you up a load of marks before you really even get into looking at the sources is the fact that, um, you, that, that you can't create a meaningful picture of Nazi Germany over six years by simply looking at three sources. They are by their nature, going to be incomplete. Um, and the, so here, the thing to do, to start off with, is to look at what's missing, to look at the things that aren't there, to look at the omissions and the errors and, um, the, and, and suggest areas that could be um, explored instead, or as well as. So look, let's look at, we've looked at A, we'll come back to that in a moment, let's look at E and F. Ah, E, we've talked about too. So, um, we'll, Andrew, we'll just look at F uh, and look at usefulness. Okay. So, this is by Oberfuhrer Greifeld, a member of Hitler's, uh, of Himmler's personal staff, in a report presented to Himmler in January 1939 on the results of the National Workshire Campaign, 1937 to 38. This evidence was presented at the Nuremberg War Crimes Trial in 1945. The tight situation in the labour market necessitated the work discipline programme. All persons who were unwilling to participate in the working life of the nation and were merely scraping by as work shy will have been dealt with by coercive means and set to work. At the same time, vagrants, beggars and gypsies were picked up by the criminal code. Currently, in excess of 10,000 A socials are undergoing a diet of work training in concentration camps. Okay, so this tells us a hell of a lot. Firstly, we know it's from this person, Oberfuhrer Greifholz. Now, I personally uh, don't know who this individual is. You know, I've read history books for many years. I haven't come across Greifholz. I'm sure that if I was a specialist on the SS, I'd know all about him, but I ain't. But I don't need to, because I know he's a member of Hitler's per Himmler's personal staff. Um, so I know that he's a relatively senior individual, um, Oberfuhrer, um, if I wasn't exactly clear on what that rank was, I can look it up, I've got a, a place of reference to start from. Um, the report he's written, I know it was written to Himmler, that's important, you know, this, um, this resource, this could have been written, um, for, for any reason. It could have been written as a speech for Hermann Goering to read out at a national conference, you know. Um, depending on who the audience was and who it was presented to, that really does shape what I think about the source in a quite fundamental way. And now that I know who it's for, it is much more useful. And I know it's written in January 1939, so I can place it in context. I know the kinds of things that were happening at that time as well, the kind of the, the move towards war and the kind of the international tensions that are occurring um, and, uh, and, and those kind of things inevitably have an impact on life in Germany. Um, I, I know um, that it was, uh, the, uh, it was a report on the, the National Workshire Campaign. So already I've been given a ton of stuff um, about this um, piece of information, this source, even before I've I've th thoroughly gone into it, um, and it rela I know it relates to some things that happened the year beforehand. Also, I know that this was evidence presented uh, at the Nuremberg War Crimes. So um, obviously, prosecutors. I don't know precisely in what context it was presented at the Nuremberg War Crimes trial. 
Um, but I know the prosecutors were clearly interested in it for some reason, and so they may have felt that it provided some kind of insight into Nazi Germany. So this is something really important. It's uh, the, you know the examiners have tagged that piece that um, uh, uh, Nuremberg trials bit on the end for a reason, because you can say, well, if the war tri crimes tribunal people thought this was important, it probably is. Okay, so. The tight situation, so this tells us, now we don't have to, what the examiners don't want you to do is to repeat the source, because it's already there for them. But what we can do is say that they're referring to a tight situation in the labour market, which uh, might mean a number of things. That might mean labour shortages, it might mean that rearmament was um, making um, labour very scarce, um, and that, again, that might have pushed up wages. And this tight situation in the labour market necessitated work the, the work discipline principle. So that this implies economic problems, um, and we assume it's looking at this period of time here. So again, this source is showing us that there were uh, possibly economic problems in that period of time with uh, the labour market. Uh, the work discipline principle. Again, what that means uh, we, we, is perhaps unclear here, but certainly it implies that the Nazi party have a work discipline principle, that they view uh, work as a very important thing and work discipline as an important thing. All persons who are unwilling to participate in the working life of the nation who are merely scraping by his workshop have been dealt with by coercive means and set to work. Well, that's a very important piece of information there as well, isn't it? So it's a real clue about... Um, how people who were uh, unwilling to work or viewed as being unwilling to work, uh, i.e. work shy, um, have been dealt with. And it's, it says here, and it, um, you know, whether Greifeld is right or not, he's claiming that all persons were um, um, uh, coerced. Now, one way you can critically evaluate that, you say, well, this is a letter to his boss, um, this is a report to his boss, to Himmler. So, of course, you might tell him that everybody has been rounded up. And that's what someone like Himmler would like to hear. At the same time, vagrants, beggars and gypsies were picked up by the criminal police. Isn't that interesting? The criminal police. So it's not always the secret police. It's not always the Gestapo doing these kinds of things. You've actually got the criminal police itself carrying out what appears to be social and racial policy. So, wow, what a clue. We've been shown there that there is uh, you know, a widespread collaboration between the criminal police, who are really you know, civil servants, for want of a better word, and the regime itself. I mean, the extent to which the criminal police were obliged to do this kind of job and to the extent to which they relished it is, is a, a moot point. We don't have to go there. Um, evidence would suggest they were, they were really rather fond of their work. Um, current, uh, currently, in excess of 10,000 day socials are undergoing a diet of work training in concentration camps. So, great, we've got some figures there. That tells us uh, by 90, January 1939 how many a socials were in work camps um, and what the, what um, Greifeld, what the SS believed really was going on with them, whether this, uh, whether they're actually receiving work training or simply being starved and beaten is, is a different question but it also shows us that the view of the SS was that um, the concentration camps were kind of were places where people learned to learn to work or learn to get a working attitude about themselves. So I would say, if this is a 32 mark question, you're looking obviously at three sources, ideally about 10 marks apiece. I think I've probably combed 10 marks out of that one there, just by using my eyes, just by using my common sense, and I don't really have to bring all that much contextualising knowledge into play. There are, you, you, need, you do need to use your own knowledge, um, we're looking, you need to evaluate the content and authorship, use your own knowledge. Um, without really even bringing much knowledge in, I've brought about a huge amount of uh, analysis, and that's going to bring me, bring me in the marks. So the, one of the good things about um, source questions, I mean, lots of people hate them, 
But one of the good things about them is that you can, to some extent, go into an exam with less subject knowledge. And this is why, basically, they dreamt up source questions in the first place. You can, to some extent, go into an exam with less subject knowledge and manage to um, pull a strong answer out of the hat by using your common sense. Um, so this is the kind of thing that you would repeat for the other two questions, I'm, I'm the other two sources. I'm not going to do that now because otherwise this um, uh, video cast will get so unbelievably long and boring that no one will ever watch it. Um, but then you would draw it together in a conclusions and, and try to create an overall picture. So you might say, overall, there are strengths and weaknesses with the sources, um, but um, if one was to create a one wanted to create a kind of a real thorough picture of Nazi Germany between 33 and 39, you'd need to ally these sources with a whole range of other contextualizing knowledge. And that is your answer. Okay, so if you found this useful and helpful, um, I will be in the near future running a series of webinars and um, which will take you through everything you need to know for the HY2, HY1 and HY4 papers for the, uh, for, for the summer, for Nazi Germany and for the Tudors. And if you ask me nicely, maybe a couple of other topic areas as well. So you can find out more about this by visiting my website www.explaininghistory.com or emailing me directly at info at explaininghistory.com. So if you want to reserve your place on the webinar, contact me directly and I'll put a link uh, once the webinar is up and running under this video. Yes, actually, check under the video right now um, and there should be something, assuming this is a week or so has passed, ready for you there and you can link up and uh, get your place on the webinar. Anyway, I hope you found this useful and I'll catch you on the next Explaining History videocast.